Now, to try and avoid what um, one of my colleagues used to call death by PowerPoint, <laughs> I'm going to use very few slides, and that's it, with deference to my, speaking, my colleagues speaking before and after. So I've only got a couple of slides. And what I want to do is really try and explain some of the issues in the same way that I would try to explain them in clinic um, to a patient with myotonic dystrophy. And I think the heading of the talk was management of um, excessive daytime sleepiness. And I get to make it rather broader than that and talk about the causes of daytime sleepiness. But to start off with, um, talking about what, what we're actually talking about, what do we mean? And there are three words or terms that have somewhat overlapping meanings and can cause a lot of confusion in management. And the, the first of those words is fatigue. And fatigue is a word that has a very specific meaning in the world of physiology. And it's not quite the same meaning as we all use it in everyday life. And what fatigue means is it's very effortful to do something. You're not weak, it's not due to weakness, but it is an effort to do normal activities. And fatigue is a very, very common problem in general practice. We see it in many other um, neurological disorders. We see it in multiple sclerosis as a major problem. And of course, many of you will be familiar with chronic fatigue syndrome, in which fatigue is the main problem. Hands up in the room, anyone who has not got myotonic dystrophy, who ever feels fatigued. <laughs> and relating to an old joke, the rest of you are liars. Um, so fatigue is a common symptom in, the, in life. Um, if you've got fatigue and you've got myotonic dystrophy, it doesn't necessarily mean the two are related, although they often are. The other word that causes confusion is apathy. And apathy is a state of mind. It is a lack of desire to do something, a lack of interest, a lack of drive in, in common parlance. And some of you this morning probably got up and thought, oh, bloody hell, I'm going to have to go and listen to that Hilton Jones again. I'd rather stay in bed. <laughs> Some might call that common sense. Others would call it apathy. <laughs> And I, I remember many, many years ago, one of Mark Rogers' predecessors in Cardiff, who was one of the doyens of myotonic dystrophy, said that when he went to, some, to, to the home to visit somebody with myotonic dystrophy, he could always tell when he got to the end of the street which house the person lived in, because the garden was unkempt. The person had no drive to go out and do the, the gardening. And then the third term is sleepiness. And the first two, apathy and fatigue, don't involve sleeping. They may involve you sitting around doing very little, but they don't involve you actually falling asleep. And what we're going to talk about is daytime sleepiness, and daytime sleepiness can be normal. And there are probably many people here, particularly in the older age range, who may sit down after lunch and have a snooze for half an hour. And that is normal behavior. But what we're talking about here is excessive daytime sleepiness. And that means essentially falling asleep when you don't want to, or in inappropriate uh, circumstances. And inappropriate circumstances may be at work, sitting at the desk at your computer, the next thing you know, the manager's shaking you on the shoulder because you've fallen asleep at work. In social circumstances, there may be half a dozen of you sitting down for lunch, and the person with myotonic dystrophy, you look around and see that they've fallen asleep when they're sitting eating. It is inappropriate um, sleepiness, and it can occur at any time of day. Where's Margaret gone? Where's Margaret Bowler? She, oh, there, Margaret. And it can be socially very difficult, and Margaret many years ago told me a story about her husband, her late husband. And at that time, Margaret was working as a midwife. And she'd say she would come home from work, having had a busy day at work, and would be telling her husband what she'd been doing at work, and then realized he'd fallen asleep while he was listening to her. 
And she understandably found that very upsetting. It was socially um, extremely disruptive. So excessive daytime sleepiness can be a major problem at work. It can be a major problem within the social environment. And it is a very common symptom in myotonic dystrophy. How you define these things, but in one uh, study, about 70% of people had a degree of excessive daytime sleepiness. But I said already, some daytime sleepiness is normal. How do we assess sleepiness? And there are various ways of doing it, and there are scientific ways of doing it in the laboratory. And there are sleep clinics and sleep laboratories, and you can bring the patient into hospital and assess their degree of daytime sleepiness. And there are some very well-known tools for doing that. There's a test called the multiple sleep latency test, where you get the person to lie down periodically in a quiet room and let them go to sleep if they want to, and you time how long it takes to go to sleep. And people with excessive daytime sleepiness tend to fall asleep more quickly. There's another test called the maintenance of wakefulness, where you try and get the patient to sit there doing something very tedious and tell them to stay awake, and they don't, they fall asleep. And we've used a modified version of that, which perhaps mimics a little bit sort of conveyor belt work, uh, factory work, where you sit looking at a flashing light. And every now and again, the light flashes for twice as long as the other times. And every time it happens, you have to press the button. And it's incredibly tedious. And people with excessive daytime sleepiness fall asleep. So you can do these scientific tests. And many of the studies that have been done have, have used those tests. But the other way of doing it, which is much more convenient, is to use self-assessment scales. And some of you here uh, will be familiar with those. And anyone who's been to our clinic, and, and I think also Cardiff, we routinely uh, use screening tests. And the um, best known one is the Upworth sleepiness scale. And it uh, says, how likely are you to fall asleep in certain circumstances? And if you can't read it at the back, so it's sitting and reading, watching television, sitting and talking to somebody. And so you can give a score for each of these. And the total score is 24. And if you've got a score of 10 or over, it's thought you have excessive daytime sleepiness. There is actually a, com a complexity, going back to the terms I was talking about earlier on, because there is an overlap with fatigue as well. And following uh, the last International Myotonic Dystrophy Consortium meeting, uh, we are now trialing um, a slightly different questionnaire. Uh, you won't be able to read it, it doesn't matter. But it, it includes some of the questions of the Upworth sleepiness scale, but also some questions relating to fatigue and apathy. And we're trying to work out whether this scale might be more suitable than this one. On this one, there are some limitations for people with myotonic dystrophy because a couple of the questions there relate to what happens when you're in a car driving or, or as a passenger. And of course, some people with myotonic dystrophy never go out in a car, so they can't answer the questionnaire truthfully because they're never in a car. So we're looking at other possible ways of um, assessing uh, sleepiness. But at the end of the day, actually, the easiest way of determining if somebody's got excessive daytime sleepiness is to ask them. And you ask the simple question, do you fall asleep during the day when you don't want to? That's a simple enough question. But going back to what I said about Margaret earlier on, the patient may not perceive it as a problem. It may be the family, the carers, the spouse, the children that see it as a problem. And the person with myotonic dystrophy, perhaps relating a little bit to the fact they've also got some apathy and fatigue, is perfectly happy sitting, sleeping for six hours a day. Yeah. It doesn't concern them. And it's very important to determine that, because if you then try and treat the problem, if you're treating a problem that somebody doesn't think is a problem, they're not likely to come back and say, thank you very much for sorting me out. And it's an incredibly simple observation, but it's actually a, a very, very important one. So excessive daytime sleepiness, very common, 70%. Some it's a minor issue. Some it occupies a lot of time, but is not a concern for the patient. But for some, it has a devastating impact. And people will lose employment because of it. They will lose the ability to drive because they can't drive safely. 
they will lose their spouse because she gets fed up with him and disappears. So, that's what it is. What are the causes of it? Why does it happen? We think that by far and away the commonest cause is that it is an integral part of the brain dysfunction that happens in myotonic dystrophy. And there's a bit of the brain at the very back part of the brain called the reticular activating system, which is basically what keeps you awake. And when you go to sleep at night, it switches off and it lets you get to sleep. And in patients with myotonic dystrophy, we do have evidence of some pathological changes there. And it probably is the central mechanism that stops the normal stimulation and allows people to drop off to sleep. So it's an integral part of the condition. And we know the brain's affected in myotonic dystrophy in other ways. And it's not really on the theme today, but we know particularly children with congenital myotonic dystrophy may have significant learning difficulties and cerebral problems. It's less of an issue in people who develop the condition in, in adult life. Um, but even in them, there may be features, including the apathy I mentioned before, which we think relates particularly to dysfunction at the front part of the brain. So we think in most people, it is due to a physical problem with the brain. But, and it's an important but, there is another potential cause of sleepiness during the day. And that is disturbed nighttime sleep and has a very obvious premise. If any of you have a bad night's sleep, you feel tired the next day. You're more likely to drop off the next day. So what might disturb the sleep in somebody with myotonic dystrophy that contributes to the tiredness during the day? And the, the main problem relates to what we call sleep disordered breathing. And problems happen to breathing during sleep, which disrupts sleep. Now, just thinking about that very simply, the purpose of your breathing is to bring in oxygen to the body needs and to get rid of carbon dioxide, the waste product of the body. And when you go to sleep, the breathing becomes more shallow because the body's needs reduce. But in some people with myotonic dystrophy, they have significant weakness of the breathing muscles. And that may be evident during the day when they try and exert themselves, they get breathless. And many of you in the clinics you attend will have your breathing capacity measured by blowing into a machine. And in some people, their breathing becomes very shallow, and at night when they go to sleep, it becomes even more shallow, and the oxygen level in the blood drops, and the brain picks that up, and it tries to wake you up to make you breathe more. And in some people, they will actually wake up. So people will say, I re repeatedly wake during the night. Don't know why, but I do. But in other people, they don't actually wake up, but the brain is stimulated to go from deep sleep to shallow sleep, which makes them breathe a bit more. But they don't actually wake up. So they may not realize they've got disturbed nighttime sleep, but they're not getting a quality <coughs> night's sleep. And that contributes to the tiredness during the day. And then in some people, the, because, because of muscle weakness around the throat, the airways close in sleep and they can't get enough air in. The airways are blocked, called obstructive apnea, stopping breathing. And what the spouse or partner may be aware of is that the person snores a lot or grunts a lot or actually stops breathing during sleep. Some of you will be aware there is a, a condition in the general population called obstructive sleep apnea, which is particularly seen in people who are obese, and they have problems with their airways because of the fat around their neck. And they have the same problem as snoring during the night, and they're tired during the day. And another feature, they often wake up in the morning, and because they've had a bad night's sleep, because they might get a bit of retention of carbon dioxide because they haven't breathed it all out, they wake up with a headache, feel groggy in the morning. But a very common feature of it is the tiredness during the day. So that can be a problem. Statistically, we think it's actually uncommon compared with the central mechanism. But it is a very important problem to identify because it has a very specific treatment. And that is the use of ventilation at night to improve breathing during sleep. And that leads on to the, the final part, which is manage the daytime sleepiness. And obviously, if the problem is the breathing, 
then the treatment for that is to help the breathing at night. And you'll hear more later about non-invasive ventilation. And non-invasive ventilation is used not only for treating the sleep problems, but it's also used for treating problems with, for example, recurrent chest infections because the breathing muscles are weak and you're not able to clear the airways properly. So non-invasive ventilation may be used for several purposes. And Chris said before that our experience is that patients with myotonic dystrophy are often intolerant of non-invasive ventilation. But one of the main reasons why people are intolerant is because of the reason we use it in the first place. And more often than not, we might use NIV, non-invasive ventilation, to try and treat excessive daytime sleepiness. But going back to what I said before, if the patient doesn't regard it as a problem, they will see no benefit from clamping a mask on their face at night and trying to sleep with a machine blowing air at them. So part of the intolerance is because they're not getting any useful symptomatic relief from it. But if we assume it's the, the commoner central cause, um, one thing that's very important to forget is just simple sleep hygiene measures. And it's important to make sure the person does get a good night's sleep. And just very simple things, such as not drinking caffeinated drinks late on at night, which contributes towards a poorer night's sleep and exacerbates the, the daytime sleepiness. Um, Obesity. Obesity is a big problem for two reasons. It limits the movement of the diaphragm, so that can contribute to the, uh, the hypoventilation. And also, it can lead to obstruction up here in the same way as any other obese person. So obesity should be managed. And our experience also suggests that if people become generally fitter, if they exercise more, that can also help reduce the daytime sleepiness. But perhaps in part, what it's also doing is trying to help the fatigue and the apathy by giving some direction during the day, but also probably getting the person uh, fitter. And the other thing that can be done, which is very obvious, is just to use what I would call simple stimulants, of which you've all been drinking some in the coffee break. And as you all know, there are some soft drinks um, which contain large amounts of caffeine. And some people with mild excessive daytime sleepiness will simply use um, coffee or caffeine-containing drugs, like, uh, uh, agents like Red Bull, to help the sleepiness. But then we're left with some people who have really very troublesome excessive daytime sleepiness. It's interfering with their lifestyle, and they want it treated. And Chris already alluded to the fact that uh, one of the drugs that we have used in this condition is a drug called modafinil. Actually, the history of using these so-called psychostimulant drugs goes back longer than that. And there are a few reports going back 30 years ago of using amphetamine, speed, as a stimulant. And probably all of these psychostimulant drugs were, are, can be of benefit but the concern with the older drugs, like amphetamine, was the addiction risk of the drug, which was a great concern. And modafinil was invented and released um, probably about 15, 20 years ago now. And it was developed for treating a specific condition called narcolepsy. And narcolepsy is a, a relatively uncommon condition, which also has to do with brain dysfunction in which people have the same type of excessive daytime sleepiness. They fall asleep involuntarily during the day. They also sometimes have other problems. They may have episodes when their muscles become partly paralyzed and they collapse. They may have problems with dreaming, uh, vivid dreams. And modafinil was invented for treating that condition. And it's been shown that it is a, an effective drug for treating narcolepsy. And it is safer than some of the pre-existing drugs. It has been used as a drug of abuse, uh, particularly in America, by college students. And they've taken the drug to try and keep themselves awake before exams to give them more time to revise. And some of them think it also stimulates the ability to retain information. And about 20 years ago, um, one of our colleagues, uh, Max Damien, did a small study in half a dozen people with excessive daytime sleepiness and gave them the drug, and they showed a marked improvement. And we then did, about 15 years ago, a more detailed study on about 20 patients, where we did things like the wakefulness test, what, watching the flashing light, and showed that it had some beneficial effect. 
and a number of other studies were done, and the results were all a little bit borderline. There was a hint of benefit, but it wasn't terribly dramatic. But as we got more experience using it, what we realized was that the patients we looked at in the study, some of them, their excessive daytime sleepiness was actually quite mild. And going back to the point I made earlier on, for some of them, it wasn't a problem. Therefore, it didn't appear to help them because they didn't think they had a problem in the first place. And so subsequently, many of us have used it selectively. Patients who clearly have a substantial problem from it and want it treated. And in them, in about 70 to 80%, but will have a very marked beneficial effect. And we published a paper a short while ago which was based on a survey of um, people on a dietary support group. Um, we looked at over 100 patients who were taking modafinil and about 70 to 80 percent had a marked benefit and sometimes the benefit was very marked indeed and um, patients uh, described this as a life-changing drug. Now that's all very well, but then we ran into a problem which we still haven't resolved. Um, about two years ago, the European Medicines Agency reviewed the efficacy, the benefit of the drug, and its hazards. And they looked at many conditions. Narcolepsy, it's also been used to treat people with so-called shift worker syndrome. It's been used to treat various other forms of um, sleepy problem. It wasn't looked at in myotonic dystrophy. And they looked at the side effects of the drug, and there were two side effects that they were particularly concerned about. One of them was a very nasty skin eruption called Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which can be fatal. And the other was an adverse effect on the heart, causing heart rhythm problems. And that's potentially a concern in myotonic dystrophy, because as Chris has already said, the heart is quite frequently involved in myotonic dystrophy. Um, in that survey, um, the recommendation was made that modafinil should not be prescribed to children, and it should only be used for treating people with narcolepsy. And so we now have a problem that most GPs will not, or you can say cannot because of local rules, prescribe modafinil for conditions other than narcolepsy. And we haven't resolved that yet, and, and it probably won't be resolved nationally. And we're trying to resolve it at a local level for our clinic by getting special permission to do it, or to use it, obviously with appropriate warnings to the patients about the potential risk. But in our experience, choosing the right patients, monitoring them carefully, we've not experienced any of those severe side effects. But, and it is an important but, Chris has already said some people will die prematurely because of heart problems. And so it is inevitable that at some stage we'll give somebody modafinil and they will later die from a heart problem. And it will be very difficult to prove or disprove whether it was the modafinil or the myotonic dystrophy that caused the problem. So we do have a, a problem at the moment, and I don't have a solution for it. And even if I had a solution for it in Oxford, that solution may not apply within your local catchment area. So I'm afraid this is an area where um, the, there is still uh, difficulty in prescribing. And one of the problems is the prescribing authorities say, well, you don't have enough data to prove that it works and that it is safe. And there we have a problem, because this is a relatively rare condition. And to do a big enough study to prove benefit and safety would take many, many centers contributing many patients. And that is incredibly uh, expensive. And we did, when we did our study of 20 patients, we were only able to do it because of funding from the drug company. But just to look at 20 patients cost £40,000. And it's going to be very difficult to do a big enough study to prove the benefit. And uh, Antonio, I'll tell you, we'll talk later on uh, about breathing issues. And we looked at trying to get funding for a study. And we were looking at funding in the region of uh, up to a million pounds. And it's very difficult to do these things. It's one of the problems we have in rare diseases is trying to accumulate the data in the same way that it is very easy to 
do a study of a thousand patients with high cholesterol and look at the effects of statins. So we have a big problem um, in a rare disease area. So I'm going to stop there. The excessive daytime sleepiness is common. It can be, but is not always disabling. There are simple approaches to try and help with the management. It is extremely important to exclude the possibility of a breathing-related problem because that is specifically treatable. Drugs may be of help, but we have some problems with the prescribing of them.